Uh, last week, I, I introduced the, the topic of leadership a little bit because we do have, yeah, it's called uh, Learn to Lead Like Jesus Led, the Lion and the Lamb. Um, because we do have seven goals that we're kind of working on uh, pretty consistently. If this is your church and I'm your pastor, there's kind of seven goals that I'm really pouring into you uh, consistently that God's really put on my heart. And one of those goals is to learn to lead like Jesus led. Because uh, Jesus, as a man, when he walked the earth, he was the greatest leader that ever lived, huh? He absolutely was. Changed the world in really about three and a half years of his ministry. Uh, he launched the church and... Uh, changed some ordinary fishermen and tax collectors, whatever else, into uh, just amazing leaders, right? Amazing world changers. Also filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. But uh, yeah, great leaders as well. So I, I do want to, you know, I do value uh, the topic of leadership, and I believe that we're all called to be leaders at some level, right? If that means your loved ones closest to you, absolutely. If that means your social circle, absolutely. That's all good. If God expands it beyond that, yay. Uh, we're all called to leadership. And leadership is simply influence, right? It really is. Uh, influencing people, what they believe, what they think, what the decisions they make. As you influence people for Jesus, right, you make a real, real difference. And learning to think like a leader is a big part of that. Right? And the Bible can be really seen as a book of leadership, too. And, and seen as many things, but a book of leadership, too. There's a lot of leadership principles in there uh, that are very, very powerful. And also, if you read the stories of the Bible, everything God ever did... He would pick somebody and turn them into a leader and then work with them and work through them. And you got Moses and you got Joshua and you got Samuel and you got, you know, the prophets and you have Peter and you have Paul and all these. But God will pick somebody and uh, turn them into a leader. And usually he picks people that are not like what we would call leadership material, right? God picks these people who are very, you know, the fishermen and the tax collectors that Jesus picked, and he turns them into great leaders, which is an example for all of us. He's like, I can do it for the fishermen. I can do it for you, right? I can do it for, so. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, all, the, all the stories in the Bible are examples of good leadership and bad leadership and what comes from that. It's a, it's a, it's a huge topic. It's very cool. So I want to explore it a little bit. Uh, so... I also believe that if you, if you desire to become a great leader, that's a good thing. Like some of us that struggle with sort of a false humility thing, like, oh, I'm a nobody, and, you know, I'm not supposed to be anybody, and blah, blah, blah. And that's a lie from the devil. Can I just be that blunt? It's just a lie designed to sabotage you and limit you. God has plans for you to be an influence and a leader in some way, Right? In increasing ways. He just does. And you're important and you matter. And if you say, yeah, I want to be a great leader. Or I want to be a good leader. I want to grow as a leader. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. Don't let false humility talk you out of that. Right? Um, but uh, motive does matter. The reason we say, yeah, God, I want to be a great leader. The reason and the motive does matter. And, and, a, and a story that I w just want to share briefly to open this is uh, about King Solomon. Second Chronicles 1, 6-12. That uh, King Solomon, uh, yeah, Solomon was King David's son, who be, he becomes the next king. And as he's becoming king, uh, Solomon has this great encounter with God. You might be familiar with the story. Solomon went up to the bronze altar before the Lord, which is at the tabernacle of meeting, and he offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. That's a pretty good offering, isn't it? <laughs> he was getting God's attention, too. Uh, and on that night, God appeared to Solomon uh, I think in, in the Kings it says that it was in a dream, but, it, but he did appear to him and to, spoke to him and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Hmm. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this great people of yours? And then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but you have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. Wow. Right? So this is a classic example of Solomon who approaches God humbly, 
with honor, right, and hunger for God. He wants an encounter with God. He wants direction from God. And, he, and God says, what do you want? And Solomon said, I want to be a good king for your people. He's, it's not about me. It's not about I want to be glorious. I want to be all-powerful. I want to boss people around, right? I want to be important. I want king before my name. He said, I want to be a good king for your people. I want your people to prosper and thrive and right, be, live in safety and expand. And I want, you know, and God said, good answer, right? <laughs> like, good answer. I'll give you the wisdom and the knowledge, and I'll make you a great king, and I'll bless you in all kinds of other ways besides. Awesome, right? Right, because motive matters. Motive matters. But uh, but then later on, it's not on the screen. But uh, Solomon, uh, one of his sons was a guy named Rehoboam, who uh, at one point also was going to become king. And Rehoboam only he wanted to be a great king too for his own ego, purely for his own ego. Right? He he didn't care about the people. He cared about having king before his name, and he cared about being able to boss people around and be important, and you know people bow down to him and whatever else. And that's all he got out of this thing. And Rehoboam said this really funny thing. Uh, as he's uh, becoming king, he said, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. Which is a very poetic way of saying, right, yeah, you've seen my father, the king, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> right? His ego was just, you know. So he wanted to be a great king too, but motive matters. Motive matters. But Solomon had it right, at least the first part of his life. <laughs> I think he got off of track a little later on. But uh, So I'm just saying, if you want to be a good leader, that's a great thing. It's an absolutely good thing. Uh, motive does matter, though. So uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, Isaiah 32, verse 1. There's uh, this really cool prophecy that Isaiah, uh, God gave through Isaiah. Uh, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. All right, so we, he's talking about the future kingdom of God on the earth, right? And uh, who is this king going to be? Obviously, that's Jesus, right? No question there. And then there's some princes that are going to rule with him. Who are those pr and princesses, it's implied, right? Who, who are those princes? That's us. That's, uh, yeah, that's one of the f early places in the Bible where God reveals this kingdom that the people with Jesus, with the Messiah, they're going to actually reign as royalty with Jesus, right? They will, there will be a king and there will be princes. Wow, that's us. So this is God's project, and that's what, that's what you're called to be. You're called to be royalty, prince, princess. You're called to reign with Jesus. Um, but uh, what's really interesting about this is that, that uh, in this world, we were not princes in this world under sin and the fall of man and, you know, separation from God and the curse of this world and all the craziness that happened way back from Adam and Eve. In this world, we were more the equivalent of paupers than princes. And paupers, P-A-U-P-E-R. If you know, the word pauper is an old, it's an old fancy word that basically means a beggar, a street beggar, like dirt poor, got nothing, right? And uh, spiritually, we were paupers. Right, the equivalent, uh, and God says, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you to be a prince." Well, here's an interesting question: If you take literally, if you take a street beggar off of the street, in most countries, there's lots and lots and lots, and there's more and more here too. Uh, if you take a street beggar off of the street and you put him on a throne in a palace, is he ready for the job? No. No, the answer is no, uh, because <laughs> he, does he have the character for it? Does he have the heart for it? Does he have right the nobility for it? The answer is no, right? Uh, we, God calls us when we're spiritual paupers, and we're very small-minded. We're very self-focused. Uh, we have, usually have bad character, <laughs> right? We have all kinds of problems and issues, right? And uh, yeah, and we're, we're, you know, and God says, yeah, I'm going to turn you into royalty. I'm going to turn you into princes and princesses to reign, to reign with Jesus. And in, even in this life, I'm going to turn you into leaders. I'm going to turn you out, out from being spiritual beggars into leaders. Uh, yeah. And uh, it turns out that's kind of a project even for God. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight, does it? <laughs> right? And so he's, you know, he's trying to, trying to change us in these ways. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because um, the, the pauper really only thinks about himself. 
He's a survivor. It's about me, right? Truly. And, uh, and princes think about the good of the people, right? Princes are leaders. They know it. They're supposed to be nobility. They're supposed to have good character. They're supposed to be a true prince will think about the people. But a pauper is very, it's just about me. And, and train, turning us from paupers into princes is a real project <laughs> that God wants us to agree to and cooperate with. <laughs> but it takes a little work, doesn't it? Can we admit that? <laughs> All right. Uh, there's another, another uh, verse that refers to this. It's in Psalm 113, verse 7 and 8. It says that God raises the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may sit him with, seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. So there again, he's talking about the pauper, which spiritually is us, right? We maybe naturally we weren't, but spiritually uh, we absolutely were. And he raises us, the spiritually poor and spiritually needy out of the ash heap, and that was us. And he seats us with princes at his table. And the princes are the people that already got saved before us, right? And as we get seated at the table, we become the new princes also and the new princesses, right? Huh. But again, the moment he turns us into princes, are we, are we ready for it? Do we have the character for it? Do we have the heart for it? Do we have the nobility for it? It's a, it's a work, isn't it? It's a work. And God's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in you, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the real challenges is uh, if you take the, the street beggar, who's basically a survivor, right? By, just by nature. Uh, they're, they're not known for, for great character. They're not known for their honesty and ethics because they're just surviving another day. Right? They're survivors. Small-minded, right? Broken people, selfish survivors. And uh, they, the, the street beggar or the pauper does not believe for a second that their life matters, really, to anybody else. They don't believe for a second that anything they say matters that anything they do matters, that their decisions matter, that their influence matters, that their behavior matters, that their relationships matter. They don't, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. And many of us, when we come to Christ, we have that mindset exactly. It's very difficult for us to believe that we matter, that anything we say matters, that anything we do matters. And that's the damage of this world, right? But God says, no, I'm gonna turn you into leaders in this life. And I'm going to turn you into princes and princesses forever. You do matter. And you'll come to the place as God transforms you where you believe, you know, and you believe that everything you say matters. And that everything you do and every decision matters and how you treat people matters every time, all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But that's the, uh, that's the challenge of God. Uh, Wow. And that's leadership thinking, too. Leaders just, leadership thinking, as you learn it, means I, I know that everything I say matters. I know that how I treat each person matters. It matters to them, and it matters to somebody who's watching. Okay? And I do have influence. You absolutely do have influence. You want to use it well. You want to harness it, right? Because you are an ambassador of Christ, and the Holy Spirit is with you and on you for influence. Right? For leadership. Oh, man, if you grasp that idea, you matter. Amen? <laughs> you matter. Yes. Changing paupers into princes. Just remember that. Uh, so let's read um, something about Jesus. It's in Revelation 5, 1 through 6. And I, I titled this, right, The Lion and the Lamb. Uh, because Jesus, as a man, was the greatest leader ever to walk the earth, Yes. And, uh, and here in, in, this, um, in this passage, Revelation 5, we, we have Jesus presented as the lion and the lamb. It's very interesting. And God, like many poets, God uses symbols to communicate, right? So is Jesus actually a lion or a lamb? No, right. But he's, the lion represents, right, that, uh, that strength, the nobility, the leadership, the reigning and ruling. And, uh, you know, the lamb represents this very tender and gentle and humble kind of nature. Uh, and so we see Jesus here in Revelation 5. It's written by the Apostle John, who is having a, literally a trip to the throne room, an encounter with God, and he sees the throne room. So John said, I saw in the right hand of him, the Father, who sat on the throne, 
a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And just so you know, uh, if you don't know what that's talking about, I'll just fill you in on that one. That the scroll basically represents kind of title deed to the earth, right? Uh, because God gave Adam and Eve dominion. They lost it to the devil. The devil kind of ran the show until Jesus came and has taken it back, right? Jesus has taken over, and Jesus is literally going to come back and take over the earth again. He's going to crush everything that's evil, crush everything that's a lie, set up his kingdom that will be love and righteousness and goodness. And, uh, and so that scroll is kind of like title deed to the earth, right? Who's, who can come back and fix this? And uh, the answer is going to be Jesus, right? Go ahead. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. He's a descendant of David. He's prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Notice uh, the, 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 one of the elders there who's in the throne room with God said, there is somebody who's worthy, right? It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, who's that? That's Jesus, of course, right? Descended from the tribe of Judah. He's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. That was even prophesied back in Genesis. And so Jesus is presented as the lion of Judah who will take back the earth, right? And John's going to look to see the lion, I want to see the lion, right? Go ahead. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood... What? <laughs> Where's the lion? <laughs> it's Jesus. He's the lion and the lamb, isn't he? But when John, he's presented the lion, and when John says, I want to see the lion, and he looks, and he sees the lamb as though it had been slain. Right? This is really interesting because, you know, the lion and the lamb represents Jesus' nature, right, as, as king and savior. Um, and the first time he came to earth, he came as the lamb, right, as the sacrifice for our sins. And the second time he comes to the earth, he comes as the lion to take over, and right? Um, but what's really interesting about this to me is when, you know, one of the elders said, it's the lion of Judah, and John turned to see, Jesus at that moment was the lamb, which tells me that, I don't, I don't know a better phrase for this, but like his resting state, you know what I mean? The resting state of Jesus, like the normal way he would appear, is the lamb. I mean, he's going to appear as a man, but symbolically, he's going to appear as the lamb. What does that mean? What it means is that his actual nature is this tender, gentle humility. When he needs to be, he can be the lion, and he will be the lion. But his kind of resting state, I can't think of a better way to phrase that, is the lamb. Like the nature of Jesus is actually humility and gentleness and tenderness. But he's very capable of being the lion when it's called for and it will be called for and he will do that. But then, right? So when Jesus comes back to the earth as a lion and takes over the earth and fixes everything, right? And then if you see him after that's all done, you'll see the lamb again. Because that's his true nature. And that's mind-blowing because the Bible says that Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father, yes? Right? Jesus is part of God incarnate as a man, perfect representation of the Father. And so if Jesus' true nature is this humility, this gentleness and tenderness, what that also means is that the Father's true nature, God the Father's true nature is also this tenderness, this gentleness, and this humility. God Almighty is humble by nature. Tender and gentle by nature. But capable of, fully capable of being the lion as necessary. <laughs> and that's just beautiful to me because that humility and that tenderness, that's a thing of beauty. That is truly a thing of beauty. Oh. And, you know, he could have, Jesus could have, you know, presented as the lion, right? When John looked over, he was like, here I am. Arr, I'm the lion, right? But, you know, everybody better know I'm the lion. Everybody better. But no, he's there as the lamb, like, with this gentleness and this humility. And, oh, you get it, don't you? 
It's mind blowing. It's so great. But here's the other cool thing is, is that the Bible clearly teaches that, that when God calls us to be his people, right? When we get born again, we become his sons and daughters, that his goal and his work is to turn us into, well, to transform us to be like Jesus, right? He's transforming us to be like Jesus so that Jesus would be the first, first born, first born bleh, among many brethren, it says in Romans 8. And uh, so God is wanting to transform us into lion and lamb nature as well. Yeah, and what that means is that, uh, yes, he wants to turn us into strong leaders. He wants to turn us into influential people who are strong and we know who we are, and we're influencers on purpose. He also wants to turn us into people who are tender, gentle, and humble at the same time. And just like Jesus, normally we would present as the lamb, gentle, tender, and humble, but the lion's there when called for. <laughs> and we have no problem rising up and leading and influencing as it's called for. <laughs> so good. I know I just got this yesterday. <laughs> I, was, I was just spending time, you know, waiting on God, and he started to speak these things to me. And I'm like, oh, oh, so good. You know, and I've preached on the lion and the lamb before, but, but, but I had never noticed this when, when, you know, the elder said, the lion of Judah, and John turns, and it's the lamb. I'd never noticed that before until yesterday. Blew my mind. <laughs> Uh, one of the principles that goes along with that is uh, good leadership, I believe, good godly leadership means you use um, mostly the lamb, but the lion as necessary, meaning uh, you use the maximum amount, maximum amount of love possible and the minimum amount of authority necessary. And that's good leadership, meaning you don't lead with authority. I, lead, I don't lead because I'm the boss. I lead with love and influence and connection and care. But use authority as necessary. Right? Beautiful leadership principle. That's worth thinking about for about an hour. Yeah. All right, let's look at one more story that I'll close with because um, I am keeping you 10 minutes later today. John 13, 1 through 15. So I love this story. It's when, uh, you know, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. M many of you will be familiar with the story. But, uh, but I want to look at it in a fresh way here, especially in the context of what we're talking about today. So Jesus is with his disciples, and he spent the last three, three and a half years turning, turning these fishermen and tax collectors and whatever else they were, ordinary guys, into, right, major leaders, into a real influential man filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to change the world. He's just transformed him into leaders in a big way. And now it's the last day before the cross, and it's a, which is Passover dinner. And before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Notice he leads with love, not authority, but authority as necessary. And supper being ended, the devil already having put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And just stop here for a second. So this is just kind of mind-blowing, really. He spent the last three and a half years turning these guys into great leaders, and they're casting out devils, and they're healing the sick, and he's preaching truth and rocking people's world and, right, messing up the Pharisees and just, you know, he just, he's on the scene making an impact, isn't he? And now he gathers these guys together, and he gets down on the ground, kind of strips down, except for, you know, and... Just like a servant. He's taking the role of a servant, right? This would be a servant's job or a slave's job in that culture. Very low job, very low. Uh, and, uh, and he starts washing their feet. And, <laughs> and the disciples are losing their minds. Like, don't do that. Don't do that. Like, that's too low for you, right? Don't do that. Real leaders don't do that, right? Real leaders boss everybody around. Come on, get up, get up, you know? And even, especially Peter. Peter was losing his mind over this. Uh, 
But Jesus is, you know, he's washing their feet. And I don't believe for a second that Jesus was trying to institute foot washing ceremonies in church. I know, I know some of you have probably done that, and, you know, it's fine. But I don't believe that's what, the, that's what the intent was. I don't believe that at all. I believe it, that was an actual job at the time that was a very humble, low job, right? Um, I know, dirt streets and sandals, right? And so, you know, Jesus is taking this very low position, washing their feet, and just messing with their minds. I mean, he's teaching them a lesson, isn't he? Right? Go ahead. And he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. You'll figure it out later. And Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. No, that's too low for you. No, no, no. Right? And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Which is true. Jesus washes us now, or we're not his, right? Okay. And Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Peter's all over the place, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else is quiet. Peter's always. <laughs> Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Judas, right? Go ahead. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Think about it. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Stop there, please. This is, this is part of the reason I'm really reading this story right now. Because Jesus just does this very humble servant kind of thing, right? The lamb, right? And uh, then he says, you call me teacher and Lord. And he said, I am. You're right. This is, what, this is really cool. The, see the, the, the uh, contrast here. Jesus is doing this very humble thing. And at the same time, he's like, oh, no, I am, I am the Lord. I am the boss. I am the leader. I am the teacher. It's me. You got it right. He doesn't have any false humility here, right? Oh, oh no, I'm not important. Oh, no, not me. No. And, you know, a lot of us would say that, and Jesus is like, oh, no, I am the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. He knows, he knows he's the leader. He knows who he is. He's very confident about it. He's very strong about it. Not arrogant, just, just absolutely factual. Yeah, I am, I am the leader. But I'm also willing to get down on the ground and wash your feet. The lion, the lion and the lamb, right? Whew. Wow. Go ahead. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. He, now he tells him just as plain as me. I did this as an example, so you know, right? I am calling you guys to be amazing leaders, and I've spent three years turning into amazing leaders. On the other hand, I also want you to be uh, humble and tender and gentle and willing to just help each other in very simple ways, bless each other, and not feel like you're lowering yourself, not feel like, you know, you're going to lose respect if you, you know, aren't barking orders, right? It's like the lion and the lamb. At this moment, I'm the lamb. But as called for, I'm the lion. <laughs> I just think it's so very cool. And he said, I'm doing this as an example for you. I want you to learn this. I want you to know who you are. I want you to know that you are called to be leaders, influencers, strong, right? At the same time, I want you to have a gentle, a humble heart and tenderness that is so beautiful. And most of the time, you'll present as the lamb. But as called for, the lion rises up, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then that's okay, right? <laughs> oh... And so, you know, and, and usually our, our, first, our first circle of, of our influence is family and loved ones, right? So we're this tender and gentle lamb with the people around us that we love, but we also are leaders and we know it, right? And, uh, and if, we, if we have that really nice balance, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, right? And then, you know, within our social circles and whatever, most of the time we present as the lamb, right? Gentle, tender, and humble, and uh, and uh, and but we're the lions, and we're not afraid to influence. We're not afraid to, right, steer something in the right direction, or speak up, or make an impact. Or you, know, you get my point, right? Beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, Jesus is turning paupers into princes, people who don't believe that they matter, into people who know that they are important, and that they are influential, and that's you. All right. Should we pray? Thanks. 
All right. Um, yeah, just a little instrumental. If you're if you're new with us, um, this is just this is a couple of minutes. We don't just dismiss. Um, this is a couple of minutes where we invite God to just touch us again, one more encounter in His presence, and for this message to for God to kind of really put this message into your heart, let it sink in. So, thank you, Jesus, that you are still raising us up out of the ash heap and seating us at your table among princes, turning us from paupers into princes in our hearts, in our character, in our thinking, in our influence, training us how to be royalty, turning us from small-minded, self-focused people into larger people, people of love, influence, character, nobility. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What an amazing thing. And that you revealed yourself to us as the lion and the lamb. So I'll just invite you to pray a prayer with me. In general, let's just ask the Lord to do that work in us, turn us into that same lion and the lamb. So if you're, uh, if you're in agreement with that, just pray with me. Say, Jesus, make me more like you. The lion and the lamb. The great leader with a gentle humble heart. Oh, I feel God. I just want to pray for you. Just, just receive. God, I pray that you anoint everybody here and watching online. Anoint them with your spirit transforming us into just like Jesus, the lion and the lamb. Strong leaders with tender hearts. With beautiful humility and beautiful boldness. With character and nobility. Royalty. Influencers. Yes, God, anoint your people. Transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love you guys.